Well, good morning. I, I don't know how much of a surprise it is to you that I'm up here, but Wednesday when I got the uh, text message from uh, uh, Pastor Dave, hey, if you'll give me your sermon title, I said, whoops. <laughs> so, so somehow I had missed it on the schedule, so it was a surprise to me as of, as of Wednesday. So, um, so anyway, but we are glad that you are here uh, today and uh, you know, I I don't know. Are there any announcements that anybody says? Hey, Mark, this is the one you need to make. I'm I've already been harassed by Ivy this morning about about being here. I was harassed by Jim about being three minutes late. I appreciate it. I I probably shouldn't say harass. I was kept on schedule. All right, there. Yes, and and so are there any announcements that any picnic next Sunday? Okay, so church picnic next Sunday after church. Got lots of things going on there. I know that the youth and family has been working on some, some things for that, for that picnic. And so looking forward to that. So make sure that you know that. So, and no choir practice. I'm glad that Kathy is up here. Amen. You know what I mean? So, so no, uh, no choir practice and, um, and a picnic next Sunday. So. Let's worship the Lord.
please stand with me for the call to worship. The call to worship this morning is from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. For he satisfies the thirsty. Let them sacrifice thank offerings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have come today, God, to to worship you, to honor you, to give you sacrifices of praise, to give you sacrifices of thanks, God, to, to pour our hearts and lives into your hands. God, we do, and we are grateful for your wonderful deeds. God, we pray that today that as we sing songs that our hearts would be engaged with thanksgiving and gratitude. God, we, we pray that as we hear your word, that, Father, that it would penetrate to bone and to marrow, that, that Father, that you would make us more into the image of your son. God, as we gather at your table for communion, God, we just pray that your spirit would be very real to us, that we would experience you like no other time. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. You know, when I saw Brad walking up front, I said, did I ask him to do this today? <clears throat> Obviously, I did not. So our opening hymn is number 96, Praise Him, Praise Him. <laughs> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Please be seated. Please join me in prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and how you work in each of our lives. Uh, we ask you to bless your church here in Anna. It's a uh, session, it's Board of Deacons and all of its ministries. We lift up the people of Ukraine, especially our Christian brother and sisters there, um, that 
their conflict ends soon with, uh, with your outcome, Lord. We lift up our missionaries, especially those we support around the world. We lift up all those who are dealing with COVID, and we ask for a speedy recovery for them, especially those in our church family. We lift up Ron and Karen Hubs for healing. We lift up our country and its upcoming elections. Um, we lift up our local, state, and national leader as, as Lord, you have your hand on, on your choice uh, for the next crop of them. We also lift up our first, respons first responders, uh, those who come take care of us when we can't take care of ourselves. We ask for blessings of, of, uh, of the hurricane victims in Florida and the Carolinas. Lord, we pray for uh, the speedy uh, repairs and, and just overall bless those folks that uh, they, need, they need our prayers right now especially. And Lord, as we, uh, as we come to you now, let's remember the the prayer that you taught your disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come to the time of our service where we give our tithes and our offerings. We give these as obedience to God. We give these for the ministry of the church and for his kingdom. Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the gifts that you give us. God, we are we 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 give these back to you to honor you, to glorify you. Father, to show you that we are grateful. God, use them for your kingdom and we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Kings, chapter 5, Naaman healed of leprosy. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, 
Would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Verse 7. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. Please stand as you're able for our second hymn this morning. Number 517, we thank thee that thy mandate, and just as a reminder, we are going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. We thank thee that thy mandate is every age the same, to preach and teach the gospel, and heal men in thy name. May every new endeavor to match this to our day, lead men to own thy lordship and walk thy holy way. We thank thee for thy preachers, thy heralds who proclaim the good news of salvation with hearts and tongues aflame. Bless thou the words they utter. May all who hear be blessed, equipped for earthly living, prepared for heavenly rest. We thank thee for thy healing of body, mind, and soul. God's wondrous love revealing that makes the wounded whole. May those by faith who touch thee and those thy touch doth bless be cured of their diseases and walk in holiness. may be seated. I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but we're going to have the gospel reading, and I couldn't remember if y'all stood up or sat down during the thing, so, so we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just sit while we're here, right? So, gospel lesson for today is from Luke chapter 17. 
On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell at um, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Verse seventeen. Then the Lord answered, "Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and to give praise to God except this foreigner?" And he said to him, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word. And Father, we come to it today with open hearts and open minds, and we submit ourselves to the truth that is in it. We submit ourselves to the one who breathed it out for us, and that is you, your son, your Holy Spirit. God, we come to hear you today. God, may you speak to us. May your presence be real. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. So, as you'll see in the bulletin, the title of this sermon is called Real Gratitude. And I have a question for us to start off here. How, how do we know if something is real? How, how do we know if something is true? right? You know what I mean? How, how, do we, how do we discover if something is real? It's not a trick question, I promise you. I'll give you the answer because you look like you haven't had enough coffee today. We look for evidence, right? If I want to know if something is real, I look for the evidence of whether something is real or not, right? I mean, it's, it's look, I would love for there to be some kind of big lizard fish dinosaur thing in some kind of lake in Scotland, right? But guess what? There's not a whole lot of evidence there. Now, now that now, I mean, we're on the internet here, so I'm sure that we'll get all kinds of weirdo comments about, oh, brother Mark, you know that the Loch Ness monster is real. And I and I would say that he's probably just as real as as Bigfoot, right? And they're probably hanging out somewhere today on this Sunday morning. But but really and truly <laughs> Todd, you're shaking your head like, okay, yeah, just wait, wait, wait for the flood there back there, right? And, and, and so, so, you know, we look for the evidence of these things. We, we, look for, we look for footprints. We look for trail camera pictures. We look for sonar kinds of, kinds of images to see if these things are real. We've got to find evidence of, of realness. But how do we know if things like love is real? How, how do we know if things like, like thankfulness and gratitude are real? What does real love look like? What does real gratitude, real thankfulness look like? And so today, as we look at this passage in Luke, I, I want to look, I want us to look at the evidence. And I think that today we're going to see four evidences of real gratitude. So as we look at this passage in Luke chapter 17, I hope that you brought your Bibles with you because we're kind of just going to walk through this a little bit at times. Look at specific things that, that are said here. Let me give you a little background. Because we can't just jump out of this and just say, okay, all right, here's what the verses say. Let me, let me tell you kind of where we're at. So Jesus is in his ministry. He's late in his ministry. This is towards the end of his ministry. He's been traveling. He's been preaching. He's been healing. He's been making people mad. He's been making people happy. He's been, he's been proclaiming that the kingdom has come, and he is coming near to the end of his ministry. Okay? So, in fact, Luke tells us here that he is on his way to Jerusalem. 
Now, that's not just a fact to say that he's going to Jerusalem and, and going to have a problem or going to have a party or whatever, or just going to go hang out with relatives or his disciples or go flip tables over in the temple or whatever. He's telling us this because because this this is kind of a and this is a big word for some of you. And I, and I don't even know how to how to tell you what it means other than the fact that that this is kind of part of Luke's motif and that this is Jesus's journey to Jerusalem to his crucifixion. Okay, so he's setting this story in the context of this is the end of Jesus's, towards the end of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world, to redeem his church and his chosen. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to do this. And while he is on his way, right before his triumphal entry, on the border of Samaria and Galilee, now this would have been areas that were very familiar with him. This is, this is where he hung out. This, he was the, this is where he called his first disciples in Galilee. This is, this is where his ministry was kind of somewhat based out of. So this would have been a familiar area to him. And as he's on the border, as he's traveling to Jerusalem, on the border there, he is met by 10 lepers. Now, for those of you in Southern Illinois, that is not leopards, it's lepers. We're not talking about cats, okay? Okay, we're talking about people with a nasty, gross, oozy, nasty skin disease, okay? We're talking about somebody with sores and rotten flesh, we're talking about somebody whose fingers and toes and nose and ears and appendages fall off. This is, this is a gross disease. Thankfully, we, we bathe now. We've got antibiotics. We have pretty much so eradicated this disease in, 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 in the world. Now, there are a few places that in third world countries where we still suffer. People still suffer from this disease. It's horrific. You're basically rotting to death. And he's met by these 10 lepers, and they all had the same problem. We don't know what their backgrounds were. We don't know if some of them were rich and some of them were poor. We don't know if some of them, if some of them had high standing in society. Chances are with 10 of these, they came from all different kinds of backgrounds and economics and, and all kinds of different families. We, we don't know. But they all had one thing in common. They were all rotting. And there was no cure. Lepers were seen as gross and disgusting. They were seen as cursed. These 10 guys hung out together because they shared the same problem, but they also hung out together because nobody else would take them. They were separated from all of life. They couldn't go to work. They couldn't go to church. They couldn't, go to, they couldn't go home and get something to eat. They couldn't hang out with their friends. They were separated all from life. And here they are, all 10, kind of, kind of sharing in each other's misery here. And so as the story goes, as Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem, it says that he was met by these 10 lepers. Now, I think this is interesting, and, and there's a few things here that as we look at, I, I just want to draw our attention to. If, if, I, if I say that I'm going to meet you somewhere, or somebody has met me, there's intention behind that, correct? This isn't just that they're just hanging out. They, they, they have all come together to, to approach Jesus. They're meeting him. They're, they're coming to him, right? So y'all y'all understand, understand what's going on here. They're not just hanging out by the side of the road and, oh, oh, Jesus is coming. No, no, there's intention. They came out to meet him. And because they're lepers and because of society and because of the, the, the rules and the ceremonies and the religious rituals and things that were going on on that time, they couldn't just come walking right up to him. Okay? They, they couldn't just. People... People said, you are unclean, you are gross, you are unworthy, you have to stay away, you have to stay back. But they said, we're no longer going to stay in this situation. We're in trouble. We can't get out of it. There's no cure. 
We know that Jesus can fix this. So they came out to meet him. And it says in a loud voice from far off, they said, Master, have mercy on us. Notice that they use the word us. There's a collective here, right? All 10 of them. Master, have mercy on us. And they're yelling to get his attention. They've come out for this purpose. And they call him master. By the way, Luke, Luke, Luke is the only one in the New Testament writings who uses this word for master. And, and, it's, and it's, not, it's not master like we would say somebody necessarily in charge, but, but it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of a, a, a term that is, um, that is out of respect. It, it's a respectful term. It, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, um, like the term doctor. You know, it kind of, they're, they're, it hold, even though we know, we know Doc Miller over there doesn't hold a whole lot of distinguishment. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, but what do we do? We call, we call him Doc, right? And, and there's, there's a term. So, so, so I'm, I'm not exactly an Anglophile. And if you need to know what that word is, Google it on the way home today, right? So I'm not exactly an ang Anglophile, but I, but I like some of the language, that, that, that some of that old English language, some of that British language, the word governor, right? It's, it's this, this term master, there's a, there's a respect that's put to it. And, the, and they're calling out to him, have mercy on us. Master, the one who can solve this problem, the one who can fix my plight, the one who can deliver me from this thing, the one who can restore me to my family. Master, have mercy on us. They're asking, they're crying out for mercy. They're all in the same boat, remember? They're asking for Jesus to have compassion on them. They're asking for him to show them kindness. Jesus, you can fix this problem can't. Jesus, you can restore me. I can't. Jesus, you can, you can clear this up. I can't. Jesus, you can keep me from rotting to death. I can't. Have mercy on me. David, throughout the Psalms, begs God, begs God for his mercy. He begs God. He pleads with God. God, please fix the situation I am in. I can't do it. And they're they're, they're crying for mercy based on the character and the nature and their knowledge of who Jesus is and what he has done. Remember, this is the end of his ministry. This is a familiar area he's been in. They're crying for mercy for God to fix it because they can't. They don't have the strength. They don't have the energy. They don't have the money. They don't have the ability to fix this. They need somebody else to do what they can't do. Man, there's some beautiful language and some beautiful nuance here that if we're not careful, we're going to miss. Because as they are crying out with this loud voice, as they've all ten come together to plead for the mercy, the scripture says Jesus saw them. Now there's a difference between being looked at and being seen. It doesn't say that Jesus looked at them, but Jesus saw them. That he saw them, that, that his attention was cast on them. I was talking to Doc earlier this morning. We're about finished calving. About, so for all of you, that's baby cows, just in case you didn't know. We're about finished calving. And there's oftentimes these questions of like, like, did you see the new calf? Right? And there's a difference between saying, well, I, I looked. And there's a difference between that and I saw it. See, see, Jesus doesn't just glance at somebody who's in need. He casts his attention on them. He sees them. He sees them, it says, and he saw them, not just physically, but he, but he looked at them with intention and attention. Jesus cast his gaze upon them with compassion and mercy 
and kindness. He saw the condition they were in. He gave attention to their to their rotting flesh and he had compassion. And in that compassion and in that kindness, he was doing for them what they could not do for themselves. And it says he commanded them, go and show yourself to the priest. Now, Jesus, again, remember this is late in his ministry. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world, to redeem his church. He's healed people in all kinds of different ways. He spit in some mud, rubbed it on some eyes. He touched people that were unclean. He told people to rise. He grabbed them by the hand. There was a woman even one time just grabbed his robe and was healed. So when Jesus commands them, go show yourself to the priest, this is not necessarily something completely out of the ordinary or foreign to them. This is not something that they would have gone like, well, what does he mean by that? I thought, he didn't even he didn't even heal us. First of all, remember, they are away from him. They've stood back. He's cast his attention on them. He's told them, go show yourself to the priest. This to them meant that he was healing them. They knew this. They knew that when he commanded them to go show themselves to the priest, that the, the priest was going to begin the process of restoring them to society, to their families, to their jobs, to hope. He knew that, that they knew that that's what was happening here, that he was healing them. So when he commands them to go, start the process of restoration, restoring them to worship, restoring them to family, restoring them to society. And Luke tells us here that as they went, they were cleansed. I think there's something interesting here. And we're going to see this a couple different times, and I just want you to kind of make mental notes. And some of you may not have enough mental to make notes, so make regular notes. If you're like me, I don't have enough mental to make mental notes anymore, right? Okay? So they've asked for what? They've asked for mercy. And, 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 and Jesus says, says go and, and present yourself. And he says, and it says now that they were cleansed. All right? So they've asked for mercy. They're going to be cleansed. They're being cleansed on the way. Just kind of keep track of this progress because when we get to the end, it's going to be something spectacular, I promise. And as they went, they were cleansed. Luke uses this word cleansed. It's kind of a clinical word, so to speak. And it's to say that they were not just healed, but they were beginning to be totally restored. Remember, they had to go show themselves to the priest. Remember, they're all 10 in this situation. Remember, nobody else can be around them. This, this idea of cleanse, that, that they're fixing everything. And can you imagine? Can you imagine what was going on on the road as they were headed to Jerusalem? And here the 10 of them are. And they, he told us to go. We're going. And as they're going, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, whoa, Bill, you don't stink as bad as you used to. Well, Joe. You don't stink rotten like you used to. <gasps> wait, wait. I got the ends of my fingers back. Oh, oh, look, your nose is coming back. C can you imagine just the, this, the, the, the process of as they're going and as they're looking at each other and, and as they're looking at their own bodies, as they're looking at themselves, can you imagine the party that starts to happen on the road? Look. I do a little happy dance when I find a $5 bill in my jeans. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't imagine the party that was going on on the road to Jerusalem here. And as they went, they were cleansed. They were, they were beginning to me be made whole. And then the scripture tells us, then one of them. This is the part where we're fixing to see the four evidences of gratitude. One of them, in the midst of the party on the road, in the midst of this mass healing, one again says that he saw. He was amazed. 
his attention was just drawn to. He saw that he was healed. He saw that he was healed. So they've asked for mercy. It says that they've been cleansed. And now it says that we saw that he's healed. So just remember, we've got three different words there. His reaction to what is going on gives us a look at the evidence of real gratitude. First of all, what does it say there? It says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Remember, they're on their way to the priest. They're on their way for to begin the process of ceremonial cleansing and restoration and being returned to their families. But this one, this one leper, he turns back. The first real evidence of true, of real gratitude is that thankfulness is not delayed. There was no delay here. When he saw this, he turned back and he said, I've got to go say thank you. I, I've got to go. It says he turned back. He knew he had to, he knew he had someone to thank for the condition that he was in. He he did not let his ceremonial need. This is what one of the writers said, and man, it just impacted me. He said, he did not let his ceremonial need to be restored in all of his life overrule his spiritual obligation to thank God. His, his thankfulness. His gratitude was not delayed. He turned right around when he saw what was going on. Real gratitude is not delayed. See, real gratitude sees that what is going on is outside of himself, that the blessing or the help that he has just received came from somewhere else. It replaces, real gratitude immediately replaces, I got this with, you gave this to me. Real gratitude is not delayed. The second thing is, second evidence here is that real gratitude is pointed or directed towards the ultimate giver. What does it say? He turned around, all right? He turned around, turned back, praising God. See, he, he, he recognized where this ultimately came from. You know, it's, it's easy. It's probably easier at my house maybe than some other houses. It's easier at our house to see where our food comes from. Because there's a lot of times that there's tomatoes and cucumbers on the table that Mandy picked in the garden that afternoon. And we could see, oh, came from right there. You know, it's really easy when there's a nice big old pork chop on the plate. Somebody asked me this week, said, do your kids get upset by that? I was like, only if it's overcooked. <laughs> only if it's overcooked like well they, didn't they spend time raising it yes they spent time raising it so that it wouldn't get overcooked that, that, that's the, that's what they get mad about right but ultimately that tomato doesn't come from the garden that pork chop doesn't come from the pig pen it comes from the mercy and the grace of god shown on our life and it's directed thankfulness is directed to the ultimate giver. He goes back and he's praising God. But not only that, look at what it says. And here's one of those little nuances that that's, would be really easy to miss if we're not careful because it's, it's the third evidence of real gratefulness. Okay? It says that he, that he turned back praising God with what? A loud voice. A loud voice. See, see here, here's, the, here's the, the, the truth of the matter. The same effort and force and energy was given to the gratitude, to the thankfulness, as it was the request. Because see, remember, the request was what? It was done with a loud voice. They called out. 
And he doesn't just go back going, well, I just thank God for this today and so much better and Jesus, thank you. No, he does it with the loud voice. Real, real gratitude is given with the same effort and the same energy as we ask for the blessing. It says he turned back. He was praising God with a loud voice and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet. See, here, here, here's the fourth evidence. So we've got that thankfulness is not delayed. We got that it's directed towards God. We got that it gives it, that, that gratefulness is with the same energy and effort as the request. And fourth of all, that the gratefulness is saturated with humility. What's his physical position when he meets Jesus? He fell at his feet. I think for our culture and our society, even as Christians, one of the biggest hindrances to real gratitude is that a lot of times we think we deserve what we get. Look, I deserve that tomato because we planted it, we fertilized it. When, with our garden, we don't even have to wait for God to water it. We'll just put the hose on it. I, I deserve, I, listen, I deserve a beautiful, big old Cherokee purple heirloom tomato that'll cover the whole bun when I put that sucker on a, on a hamburger. I deserve that. But listen, I love tomatoes. <laughs> But if I think I deserve it, I'm not grateful for it. One of the biggest hindrances here to true, real gratitude is that we think that we deserve it. We think that we've earned it. We think that we're, as, the, as, as we use these days, that we're entitled to it. See, this one man came and he fell on his face and thanked. Jesus. Even his physical posture indicated the condition of his heart. See, I think this humility is the linchpin in real gratitude. I promise I'm going to finish this up quick. So as this happened, Luke tells us that this one from the ten who returned was a Samaritan. Verse 17 says, Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and praise God except this foreigner? See, Jesus' questions here are an indictment on his people. It's an indictment on his people of all the people in the world who ought to know and, and, and show evidence of real, real thankfulness and gratefulness. Christians have the most to be thankful for. We should be the most grateful. See, his indictment here about the foreigner is because his people weren't grateful. His people didn't show true gratefulness. They were more concerned about their restoration, their blessing, the things that they had. God was not the center of their attention. You know what? It's, it's easy. I, I, I make a joke a lot, and, and some of you have probably heard me say it. And and I'll and I'll probably say it till the day I die, and 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 I and I I mean it kind of tongue in cheek, but but there's a lot of truth to it. Actually, I, I feel sorry for people that aren't me. You know, <laughs> I do. I have I have a wonderful life. I have a wonderful. I've got. Listen, I don't know about the rest of you all, but I can tell you this: I got the most beautiful woman in the church as my wife today. We'll fight over it. I don't care. I, 
believe it or not, as, as not heady as they are, I've got some really good kids. Barring one, two, three. Well, I've got five. So I've got one good kid. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I've got, I've got good kids. You know, I've, I've, got, I've got good kids. I have, I, 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 I ate, and I know this is going to surprise most of you, I ate more yesterday than I needed to, to survive. I, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm not bragging. But I bought, I bought $3.99 gas yesterday and filled up the whole tank. <laughs> oh, all right, yeah. I, th- th- thanks, Doc. See, see, I'm good enough. I don't have to drive to Jackson to get my under three dollar gas. All, all, all I'm saying is, we have a lot to be thankful for, and it's not just me. It's it's not just me. I I, I laugh and joke about those things, but it's not just me. We all do. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, what we're going to do is, is we're going to fall into the same position that these other nine did where we think we deserve it. We, we think we've earned it. We, we, think that, we think that there's no problem now. But here, here is what those nine missed more than anything. Because Jesus makes a pronouncement here at the end of it. He says, your faith has made you well. Remember, they've, cr- they've cried for mercy. It says they've been cleansed, they've been healed. Jesus uses the word cleansed again. But here at the end of this, here at the end of this, he doesn't talk about just their physical healing. He says, you've been made well. You've been made well. You've been made whole. You've been saved. The greatest outcome is a total renovation. Not just of the outside, but the whole man. Listen to me. God blesses us. God gives to us. God grants us the things that we need. God gives us these things. God God restores us. God, God fixes our problems. God does all of these things to draw us close to himself. And if we're not careful... We'll miss the biggest, best blessing that he has in any blessing he hands down to me. We forfeit the greatest blessing when we forfeit real gratitude. Real gratitude reflects a real relationship with God. What does your gratitude reflect? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are a people who you have blessed and given to abundantly. We are a people who have more than we know what to do with at times. And yet sometimes, God, we are, we are the most ungrateful. God, we repent of that today. We turn from that. We turn from fake, pleasant thankfulness to real gratitude. God, help us to love you with our whole hearts. May we find you, may we find you in the center. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. I have to find my bulletin or I won't have the right order. As we uh, prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, as we prepare for this communion with Christ, please stand with me as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to this time of communion, I, 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 I don't know, maybe I've confessed this before. Growing up in church and even, even pastoring churches, I, I think that a lot of times I, I missed one of the most essential parts of communion. There were a lot of times in my life that I thought communion was all about making sure that I was good enough to come to the table. Making sure that, that, that Jesus would be happy, to me, happy with me when I showed up. And I spent a lot of time in guilt and angst about, oh, man, what if I take this and I die? And, and, and let, me, let, me just, let me just say this. Scripture bears that out, that if we take this in an unworthy manner, there are consequences. And man, I used to hammer on that a lot. But let me, let me say this. This is a time for you to meet with your Savior. This is a time, we call this communion. And, 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 it, and, it's, and, it's, and as we, as a church, gather to do this, there, 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 is, there is, yes, there is that, that, that mystical union that happens that, that where, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. And that's for you to meet him here and for you to be restored here. For you to receive the grace that he has given to you on the cross. See, we come not because we're worthy. We come not because we have righteousness of our own. But we've come because we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, we come because, because not that there's magic in what we're taking here, but we come to meet with the Savior who the bread and the wine represent. We come because Christ calls us to come. He calls us to come. If you are his child, he is calling you to come to his table and commune with him today. We come because here we can confess and we can repent and we can be restored to him. Let us take a moment in silent confession. God, I confess. I confess that I have sinned against you and I have fallen short of the glory that you reveal to us. God, I thank you that your word says that you are God who forgives sin and you forgive it based on the sacrifice that Jesus made. God, we come today as we confess those sins in our hearts and in our minds and our attitudes and our actions and in our thoughts. As we confess those, God, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your love. We receive your grace at this table. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. As we take this bread and this cup, when we take this in our hands, we need to remind ourselves of whose body that it was that was broken and whose blood that it was that it was shed and that he did that for us. On the night 
on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He was with his disciples. And he broke bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Let's pray. God, we ask your blessing upon this time together. We ask your blessing upon these elements that we may worship you in spirit and truth as we take them. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus told his disciples, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Scripture tells us now in the same manner after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me.
book of Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. My charge to you as we have met at the Lord's table, as we've come as a family to meet with our Savior, my charge is that you would rise from this table with new strength, with new courage, with new poise and power to live for him who died for us. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn. Number 302, I Love to Tell the Story. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell a story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the
As we depart, receive this benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with every good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah.